Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Monday, September 19th, 2016. Here are our top stories. Tonight. After ISIS bombs New York, the U.S. becomes the Air Force for ISIS, striking a Syrian army base and killing up to 80 Syrian soldiers in the process. Meanwhile, a very angry Vladimir Putin calls for an urgent U.N. Security Council meeting to address the attack. Then, Barack Obama repeatedly took credit for ending the war in Iraq. But U.S. troops are back for what the Pentagon says will be logistic support for a Mosul invasion. All that plus much more up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. Well, President Obama held a press conference today to talk about the terror attacks, although he wouldn't call them terror attacks, in New York City, the bombings, although he wouldn't call them bombings. They were very reluctant to call it what it was, and they criticized Trump for saying that. But I think it's interesting to hear in this press conference Obama talking about the U.S. bombing in Syria. Here's what he had to say. We will continue to lead the global coalition in the fight to destroy ISIL, which is uh, instigating a lot of uh, people over the Internet uh, to carry out attacks. Uh, we are going to continue to go after them. We're going to take out their leaders. We're going to take out their infrastructure. They are continuing to lose ground in Iraq and in Syria. Now, Obama, I think, was telling some of his most cynical lies of the press conference when he talked about what happened in Syria. Notice also that he focuses on the Internet. Whenever they talk about ISIS, it always comes to the Internet. But we've had a massive bombing campaign with us becoming the Air Force for ISIS. This is something we talked about for a long time, but let's talk about what actually happened over the weekend in Syria. This story from antiwar.com, ISIS overruns Syrian army base after U.S. bombing. So we bombed this base and then turned it over to ISIS. In defense of an airport that uh, the Syrian military has long depended on, an air army base in Jabal Tharda to repel ISIS advances, that base has now been lost this weekend after a disastrous series of U.S.-led airstrikes killed a large number of Syrian troops defending the base, and ISIS quickly overran what was left for over 20 minutes. The coalition warplanes attacked the base. The attack killed at least 83 Syrian troops, wounded 120 others. U.S. Central Command claimed they thought the base belonged to ISIS. We'll take a look at the credibility of that in just a moment. Well, it does now, says anti-war. With the forces decimated by the U.S. attack, ISIS quickly overran the base. The U.S. continued attacking Syrian troops until they were warned by Russia that they were attacking the wrong site. After being contacted, the U.S. since expressed regret also, though, condemned Russia for calling an emergency U.N. Security Council meeting over the matter, insisting everyone knows the U.S. would not ever intentionally strike a known Syrian military unit. Now, this is a ceasefire going on in Syria that's not even a week old that is falling apart. But this story that we've carried, um, I guess, about a year ago, well, actually about uh, not even that long ago, December 22nd, 2015, Paul Joseph Watson reported, shocking report, Pentagon defies Obama's policy of arming ISIS jihadis. Now, go back to 2013, when Obama administration was trying to get us involved in the Syrian war directly. And at that point, we talked about the uh, false flags of the gas attacks and so forth. And we had a lot of U.S. soldiers of all different branches of the military holding up signs saying, we will not become al-Qaeda's Air Force in, uh, or Sy ISIS's Air Force in Syria. And he pointed out Twitter was flooded with images of U.S. service members expressing their staunch opposition to being forced to act as Al Qaeda's Air Force. Reports of the time also confirmed that top military officials were dead against airstrikes. Now, an explosive investigation, again, this was last December, so nine months ago, an explosive investigation by Seymour Hersh revealed that the Pentagon was engaged in a secret revolt against the Obama White House at the time. A highly classified uh, DIA and Joint Chiefs of Staff report predicted that arming the rebels and toppling Assad would lead to the rise of ISIS. The Pentagon knew that Obama was arming Islamic extremists, but the so-called moderate free Syrian army, and of course also al-Nusra, and we'll talk more about al-Nusra in just a moment, 
had evaporated. But the Obama administration didn't want to hear the truth and deliberately buried the report. So the Pentagon bypassed the White House entirely and handed intelligence on the same jihadists who the Obama, who Obama was arming to Germany, Israel, and Russia. Okay, now that was nine months ago. Going back three years ago, saying we're not going to be Al-Qaeda's Air Force in Syria, because that's what ISIS is. It's just a rebranding of Al-Qaeda. And then we learned nine months ago that there was a revolt in the Pentagon, not only with the grassroots soldiers understanding what was going on, but also officials in the Pentagon. But now, evidently, things have changed. This story today on Infowars.com, how the U.S. became ISIS's Air Force. The U.S. Air Force, again, this is the story that I just read to you, but in more detail. They said just hours before this strike, 1,000 elite Syrian commandos had arrived at this base that was taken out in preparation for an offensive against ISIS terrorists in the area. As a result of the Obama administration's bombing of these Syrian soldiers, ISIS had taken control of the area near the military base in the city. This has put the city of Deir Zor with 200,000 lives under threat of an ISIS invasion. Moscow then called for an urgent security council meeting to discuss the attack. The U.S.'s presence in Syria, and this is important, the U.S. is there not under the invitation of Syria. Russia is there under the invitation of the Syrian government. We are there uninvited, <laughs> just like the rebels. But also, the point that there were a 1,000 elite troops that were massed there for this attack. Now, the U.S. says this was an accident. We didn't know that was a Syrian base. Here's what they have to say. The U.S. State Department claimed that the attack was an accident. However, facts point to the contrary. The Tharda Mountain, where the attack occurred, has always been under Syrian army control with no prior presence of ISIS. So they say they attacked this base thinking that it was ISIS. This has always been a Syrian army base. They knew that it wasn't ISIS, just as we've seen in other situations where they attacked hospitals. They knew that that wasn't, um, uh, it wasn't a mistake. We continually see the Pentagon coming back with these excuses saying, we didn't know. We had no idea what was here. <laughs> Nevertheless, they want to tell us, on the other hand, that they can do pinpoint surgical strikes with drones, that they know everything about everyone. I'm more inclined to believe the latter, that they know all of this. I don't believe these lies. They say at the same time of the incident, now this is also important, at the same time of the incident, the Israeli Air Force also attacked the Syrian army while fighting al-Qaeda, and al-Qaeda-linked terrorists near Golan Heights effectively acting as al-Qaeda's Air Force. The timing of the two attacks suggests some kind of coordination between the Pentagon and between the Israeli Air Force. Again, coming in on the side of al-Qaeda, that is what we continually see. Nevertheless, we have Hillary Clinton coming in and telling us in the past uh, she's not going to have any ground troops in Iraq ever again. Remember when she and Donald Trump spoke to the military forum? Hillary Clinton said, not ever again, we would not ever have boots on the ground to defeat ISIS. Quote, we are not putting ground troops into Iraq ever again, and we're not putting ground troops into Syria. We're going to defeat ISIS without committing American ground troops. Well, the military is not buying it. As a matter of fact, the Military Times is saying that commanders are, quote, pissed off about the mission creep in Syria. See, when you go on missions following creeps like Obama and Hillary, you wind up with mission creep. You wind up with something that doesn't resemble at all what you thought you were getting into. They say the deal for U.S. military cooperation with Russia would expand the current mission in Syria far beyond the exclusive focus on the Islamic State group. They say this could be a massive mission creep. And this is what they're concerned about. This is a different group of people in the Pentagon. Because although we were told that in 2013, soldiers, uh, airmen said we don't want to be al-Qaeda's air force, and many in the Pentagon agreed with it, now we've got people in the Pentagon saying they're not happy because they might possibly strike al-Nusra. Well, al-Nusra is the same as al-Qaeda. These groups that are there, these so-called moderate rebels, are nothing but rebranded al-Qaeda. And at the same time that Hillary is saying that we're not going to have any more ground troops, nobody is believing it, we've already got 4,000 troops there, they want to say, well, they're not boots on the ground, perhaps they've got some super secret hovercraft that they're standing on, you know, like uh, uh, Back to the Future. Look, they're ground troops. They want to say they're there in an advisory 
capacity, that they're providing logistic support. And nevertheless, as they're building up for an October attack, perhaps the October surprise, we see that more U.S. troops, another 400 or so, are arriving at an Iraqi air base south of Mosul. And this is also reported by anti-war. They say hundreds of additional U.S. ground troops have arrived at an air base to join several hundred troops that are already there. And, of course, it's just logistical support. And that's something that is going to be coming up in October, presumably. Now, in the press conference, as Obama was lying to us about having ISIS on the run in Syria, at the same time we're destroying the opposition to ISIS and then turning that base over to ISIS, pretending that we never knew that it was Syria, he also describes what's happening with terrorism. Now, what he is saying is don't worry about the terrorists. Don't let them cause you to fear. Don't let them disrupt the way we live. Don't let them undermine our values. And nevertheless, this is precisely what his army of migrants were intended to do. Here's what he had to say. Uh, they are trying to hurt innocent people, but they also want to inspire fear in all of us and disrupt the way we live uh, to undermine our values. So Obama says we cannot let them disrupt the way we live. We cannot let them undermine our values. And yet we see this as precisely what is happening throughout the West. We see that, as a matter of fact, the terrorist incident that happened in Minnesota is a logical consequence of the massive number of Somali refugees that have been brought in by the American government. And interestingly enough, Obama, as well as the FBI, cannot bring themselves to call this terrorism. A full day after we were told that this guy came in asking people if they were Muslims, brandishing a knife and then attacking people and screaming al hu Akbar, we have the FBI coming in saying the motive still is not clear. This is what the AP and Time and other uh, mainstream media have reported. AP reports the motive is still unclear, but FBI special agent in charge Rick Thornton said Sunday the stabbings were being investigated as potential act of terrorism. Really? being investigated as a potential act of terrorism. They cannot bring themselves to even name what the problem is. And yet, here is what the problem is. Further on in the article, they talk about the fact that Minnesota has the nation's largest Somali community. This is where the knife uh, attack started. With census numbers placing the population at about 40,000. But community activists say it's even higher. They say more than 20 young men have left the state of Minnesota since 2007 to join al-Shabaab in Somalia. And roughly a dozen people have left in recent years to join militants in Syria. In addition, nine Minnesota men face sentencing on terror charges for plotting to join ISIS. This is the fruit of the invasion that is taking place in America. This is Obama's army. This is the bombing in America. So while we bomb the Syrian forces that belong to Assad in Syria for ISIS to turn over the base to ISIS, then we also bring in these bombers in massive numbers as an invasion. How many people have to come in to our country unvetted before we call it an invasion? How many times do they have to attack us before we call it an invasion? And then they say, five minutes after the authorities received the first 9-11 call, Jason Falconer, a part-time officer in the city of Avon, shot and killed the attacker. Anderson said that Falconer fired as the attacker was lunging at him with the knife and continued to engage him as the attacker got up three times. He clearly prevented additional injuries and a potential loss of life. So who is this guy, Jason Falconer? Well, it turns out Jason Falconer is not only just an off-duty police officer, he's a former police chief, and he is an instructor teaching people how to react, giving them training scenarios in a force-on-force -force situation, precisely what he did to save people's lives. And if we look at his website here and his bio, it says, uh, Jason believes that although civilian and law enforcement students can obtain great firearms training from various sources, they're missing a key component in their personal safety training without going through reality-based training. Again, a former police chief and now part-time police officer, but I think it's important to focus on the practical training that he gives people so that they don't just know how to use a firearm. That's very important to have one to know how to use it, but also to know how to react in a real-life situation. And the first course that they have listed on their website, Decision Shooting Force on Force. They describe it as the course will test your mindset, your knowledge, and your skills against a real adversary. With the use of simulation guns, students will make decisions on their feet in force on force scenario-based training. See, that's the way you prepare to protect yourself, your family, and others. 
especially when we look at the fact that here in Minnesota alone, there are 40,000 or more Somalis. But throughout this country, there have been 100,000 Somalis that have been brought into the U.S. since 9-11. 99.6% of them Muslim. And we just see that more than 800 migrants have been mistakenly granted citizenship. You know, they didn't mean to do that, just like the U.S. didn't mean to shoot up that hospital. They didn't mean to bomb the uh, base, the Syrian base that was holding back ISIS, protecting that city and then turning it over to ISIS. No, they really didn't mean to allow these uh, 800 dangerous citizens, people from countries of concern, uh, people who had committed fraud on their applications, they really didn't mean to make them citizens, really. You need to understand that you need to be able to protect yourself. And you need to keep this in mind, understand that Obama, his policies are going to be continued by Hillary Clinton, exactly. And when we look at the serious way that uh, Jason Falconer reacted to this and how he protected people, I want to juxtapose that real quickly with the new Apple iOS 10. Here is the essence of political correctness, the trivialization of all of this, taking what used to be the pistol emoji, which was too dangerous, and changing it to a squirt gun with a red tip because that's federal law. That's the absurdity. That's the political correctness. I remember when PC used to mean personal computer. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Well, this weekend, Oliver Stone's movie about Edward Snowden premiered. And I have to say, it is one of the best movies I've seen in a long time. Very well made, very entertaining for those of you who have friends who don't really understand what's going on with this, who don't have the background for this. It lays it out in a dramatic standpoint. It gives a context to what Edward Snowden did. Not only a personal context of what he did, but also a context in terms of surveillance and the Constitution, which is very, very important. Many people say, well, why should I be concerned about this? And that's the uh, position that his, his uh, girlfriend takes in this movie. And he has an opportunity to illustrate that to her as well as uh, Oliver Stone does a masterful job of showing the audience why that matters. It really does matter. And yet, the day after this was released, the Washington Post, one of the four news organizations that released Edward Snowden's documents, one that won a Pulitzer Prize releasing his documents, came after him and said he should be put in jail, or perhaps worse, because we had a lot of people calling for his execution. The Washington Post put out an editorial on Saturday after the movie was released on Friday. No pardon for Edward Snowden. Absolutely amazing. They say Ed Snowden is going to have, has his admirers, and after the inevitably celebratory Oliver Stone film about him appears this weekend, he may have more. Yes, if you watch this, I think you'll, you'll understand. And, of course, we can always do this with a fictional account. We can make a hero out of the person, a hagiography. I don't think that's the case here. You know, we had concerns about Edward Snowden when he first came out. We didn't know who this guy was. Whenever you see a massive document dump coming out, even though we liked the documents that were coming out, we were concerned about the rate at which they were coming out. We were concerned if this was going to be something that was, had been started by the CIA. Was this just an attempt to move the Overton window and what we would accept as being normal. And that's always a risk if people will not react to it. That's why it is so important for people to see this acted out to get a visceral understanding of the, of the uh, importance of this, the events that happened as well as the implications of what was being done by the NSA. That's the key. They want to make this about Snowden, but it is truly about the NSA. And that's what the movie shows. They point out specifically, this is going back to the Washington Post editorial, they say specifically, he made the documents public through journalists. Remember that, through journalists. This is the Washington Post admitting this. So we're going to have more to say about that. He made it public through journalists, including reporters working for the Post, enabling the American public to learn for the first time the NSA was collecting domestic telephone metadata, information about the time of a call and the parties to it, but not its content, pleads the Washington Post. Let me tell you something. That is one of the largest lies that is being sold to the American public covering this up. They want to say, they're not re listening to your recordings. They're not listening to your text. Well, they could if they wanted to. They keep that stuff. But that's not the most important thing. It is far more cumbersome for them to do it that way. The metadata is far more important than what you say or what you text. This is the whole field. And we've talked about this in the context of Jade Helm, mastering the human domain. What was that about? Well, it was really about human domain analytics. It was about activity-based intelligence. The fastest-growing field of surveillance technology is geospatial intelligence. 
What they do is they look at your friends, they look at your activities, they look at where you're going. It's all your metadata. Taking that metadata, they can very quickly algorithmically analyze that in a way that they couldn't analyze your conversations to get a very high quality profile of exactly who you are. That's how they master the human domain with human domain analytics, with geospatial intelligence. So the big lie that is being sold by the Washington Post and many of these other people, first part of it is that they are just getting your metadata, and that's not important. It is the most important thing. And then they go on to say Congress and the president eventually responded with corrective legislation. That's the second biggest lie, the USA Freedom Act. Come on. That didn't do anything. That was nothing but a head fake and a beard over the Patriot Act. Nothing has essentially changed. Now they go on and say even more unusual things. Prism, that was both clearly legal and not clearly threatening to privacy. No, Prism was the program whereby companies like Google and Apple and others would collect your information and turn it over to the NSA. Now that's why they had to keep coming at us with CISPA until they got it passed as CISA. That was to protect the legal liability of the corporations who are spying on you for the NSA. And that is very important. Again, it's your metadata. Uh, your privacy was being violated. You're being spied on by the people that you do business with and the government that says that it's protecting you. They go on to say, his revelations about the agency's international operations, in contrast, disrupted lawful intelligence gathering, caused possible tremendous damage to national security, according to unanimous bipartisan report from the House Permanent Select Committee on intelligence. Okay, so what they're saying is, uh, even though he did some of the stuff, you know, he he did one thing that resulted in the USA Freedom Act. So that's great, good for good for you. Uh, he gave us some information that really wasn't important. No, it really was. And then they say, but he really compromised our security. Well, we'll take a look at that in just a moment. But Glenn Greenwald, who worked with Ed Snowden, and was one of the outlets that put his information out there with the Intercept, he comes back and he has a headline that says it all: Washington Post makes history. The first paper to call for prosecution of its own source after accepting a Pulitzer. And let me say this to the Washington Post. If you want to say no pardon for Ed Snowden, then we have to say no pardon for Michael Hayden for the crimes that he committed against the American people, the violations of the U.S. Constitution that he committed. He bragged at Washington and Lee University that he didn't uh, need to have even Section 123. You know, he had the Patriot Act, then he had Section 123, and then he said, I didn't need any of that stuff. You know, I had an order, a direct order from the president. That trumped the Patriot Act. That trumped the Constitution. That trumps everything. See, Michael Hayden is talking about a fascist dictatorship where the president can do anything that he wants and we don't have the rule of law. So if you're going to put Ed Snowden in jail, the person that needs to be there with him is Michael Hayden, or if you're going to execute somebody, okay, take these people as well. And while you're at it, take the people at the Washington Post. But this is what Glenn Greenwald, he said, he said, three of the four media outlets received and published large numbers of secret NSA documents provided by Ed Snowden, The Guardian, The New York Times, and The Intercept have called for the U.S. government to allow the NSA whistleblower to return to the U.S. with no charges. But the Post editorial today not only argued in opposition to a pardon, but explicitly demanded that Snowden, the paper's own source, stand trial on espionage charges or, as a second best solution, accept a measure of criminal responsibility for his excesses, and the U.S. government offers a measure of leniency. And he goes on to say the first ever paper to explicitly editorialize for the criminal prosecution of its own source, one, of whose, one on whose back the paper won and eagerly accepted a Pulitzer Prize for public service, but even more staggering, says Glenn Greenwald, the Washington Post's own source are the claims that they make to justify it. Now, what does he mean by that? If you look at the articles that he shows that the Washington Post put out there, he says if the Post editorial page editors really believe that prison was totally legitimate program and that no public interest was served by its exposure, remember they said that? Ah, it's not important. Well, shouldn't they uh, talk to their own paper's newspaper editors for having chosen to make it public? And then he looks, he says, beyond the intellectual dishonesty of that, beyond saying that that wasn't really anything important when it really was, he goes down and he shows one by one the articles that they put out, which were put out by the Washington Post. And he makes the point, it wasn't Edward Snowden, and this is shown in the movie, it wasn't Edward Snowden who made this available to people. What Snowden did was he turned over the information 
to people that he believed were trustworthy sources like the New York Times, like the Washington Post, like the Guardian, like Greenwald. And he said, I don't want you to endanger anyone. I don't want you to expose any secrets. I want you to give the American people and the world community an idea of what is being done by the surveillance state. And then he erased his copy of it. And he allowed them to make those decisions. The decisions that the Washington Post made are the very ones for which they say that Ed Snowden should be put into jail for. And as they point out, he says, almost every one of these stories entailed the exposure of what Post editors today call details of international intelligence operations. And then uh, Glenn Greenwald says, I personally think these are very solid justifications for the Post decision to reveal those. He says, as Snowden explained in the first online interview with readers that, I, that he conducted back in July 20, 2013, he was not only concerned about the privacy infringement of Americans, but of citizens everywhere. Now, I would say that what you have to understand is that the tyranny of continuous surveillance is not simply a national problem. It is a problem, and it is a national problem. But it is a global problem, and it is being driven by the same globalist elitists who are trying to consolidate the world government, and that makes it even more dangerous. Stay with us. Leanne McAdoo and Margaret Howell are going to break down further what happened with the Syrian refugees. We'll be right back. Breaking at Infowars.com right now, Hillary's IT guy asked Reddit users how to strip emails. Now, this is Hillary Clinton's IT technician, Paul Combetta of Platte River Networks. He reportedly asked users on Reddit and other tech forums how to strip very VIP email addresses from a private email server. Now, these are uh, reportedly going back to the time when these emails were under subpoena. So of course, this is in total violation of the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, but the the questions titled remove or replace to from address on archived emails. Hello, all I may be facing a very interesting situation where I need to strip out a VIP's very VIP email address from a bunch of archived emails that I have. It goes on and he says basically they don't want the VIP's email address exposed to anyone and want to be able to either strip out or replace the email address in the to from fields in all the emails that we want to send out. And he also made a similar request on a Microsoft Exchange server help form as well. Um, now, like I said, if these archived emails stone tear refers to our State Department emails. This is a clear violation of the Freedom of Information Act. And uh, Combetta was apparently using this username stone tear as early as 2007. His email address is stone tear at gmail.com. Even his Etsy account is also stone tear. And uh, his full name was tied to this username when he f hosted files related in 1993 to a classic RPG betrayal at Crondor. So this guy is stone tear. I mean, it's a fact. What are you going to say? Here he is asking for help on Reddit and other Microsoft Exchange forums how to clean up this email server. This is the same guy, the oh bleach bit guy who pled the fifth. And he only pled the fifth after the committee chairman, Jason Chaffetz, took the opportunity to ask a question about a very revealing email exchange between two PRN employees. The, that email said, Wondering how we can sneak an email in now, after the fact, asking them when they told us to cut the backups and have them confirm it for our records. Starting to think this whole thing is really covering up some shady shit. So that, after that question was posed, he pled the fifth, along with the other PRN staff member. But again, folks, there's no fire here, just a lot of shady shit from the Clinton camp. Now, you can check out more reports at Infowars.com, read this one in full, and download our app at Infowars.com forward slash app. Owen Schroyer from Infowars.com are on the streets of New York where they have reopened the area where the explosion went off. They now know who was responsible. 28-year-old Ahmad Khan Rahami was captured after a shootout with police in New Jersey. He is now in custody. They do believe that this is a man responsible for the explosive devices found in New York City, the explosive device that went off in New Jersey, and five more devices that went off 
or that were found in New Jersey. They do believe there could be a link to a greater terror cell in this area, and they said he was armed and dangerous. So he is now in police custody in New Jersey, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of investigation into who else or how he started to come about these plans. We're on the streets of New York. Most of the activity has gone back to normal, but there still is a very heavy police presence. The FBI is still behind us. Police are guarding the subways, and um, but life pretty much has returned to normal. It is interesting, Cuomo has now had to come out and retract his statements and now admits that this could possibly be, or most likely is, an act of international terror. Now, we've been talking to people on the streets here in New York, and what I've realized is that most people we talk to are either unaware or unconcerned about any threats from radical Islamic terror. But as we've seen in the developments in the last really 10 hours, one man, just one man can go extreme and cause mass amounts of damage. It'll be interesting to see if the tone changes in America when people hear about this story and see the damage that not just was caused, but could have been caused by many of the devices that didn't detonate. And then also, is this man going to be an example for other people who want to come here and try to make terror happen? So this was a naturalized citizen from Afghanistan set up, I think, seven explosive devices or more uh, throughout New York and New Jersey. Some of them detonated, some of them didn't. Luckily, there were no fatalities. But this is an example how one radical Islamic terrorist, just one, can attempt to and perhaps cause mass amounts of damage. So will people be concerned about this? Will people wake up and realize that radical Islamic terror is a threat? Will the liberals continue to bury their head in the sand? Will people admit that Donald Trump was right when he told us that this was a serious threat if we did not get tougher? We will find out soon, but let me tell you folks, we know now that radical Islamic terrorists are infiltrating our country. We have seven or more explosives found from just one man. This is a clear and serious threat. We had a stabbing in Minnesota with a guy chanting Allah Akbar. This isn't a thing that happens once a year. This isn't a thing that just happens rarely. It's now happening more and more. And if the liberals in politics want to continue to bring in more refugees unvetted from the Middle East, it's only going to get worse. And I'm here with a local New York City citizen, Logan, who experienced the blast firsthand. What did it sound like? Um, honestly, it sounded like a, a dump truck hit something going 100 miles an hour, like a steel plate, to be honest. It was, uh, someone thought it was a manhole initially, but when we went outside, there was a huge cloud of smoke because I was on the corner of 7th and it was insane. I mean, everyone went crazy. So what was your first reaction when you heard the blast? Um, the guy beside me, it shook the little saloon I was in. He dropped his drink on the floor and everyone was kind of like, what was that? And then about half of the bar went outside and was checking it out. and. Then it started smelling like a bomb. So everyone started freaking out about 9-11, obviously, and the correlation between the two. So, Was that kind of everyone's first instinct, like a bomb just went off and this might be another terrorist attack? It was like everyone looked at each other and was hoping that it wasn't, but you could tell that re realistically everyone thought that, yes, that made that connection. Do you feel, though, that the fear from that night has kind of dissipated now? No. <laughs> I didn't come into the city yesterday. I'm staying in Jersey, and I refuse to come. I'm terrified. It's actually escalating because it continues to happen. So I don't think it's going to stop anytime soon, especially with it cordoned off like this. It's drawing attention. So you expect there to be more attacks like this? I hope not. But I mean, look at the past three days, what's been going on everywhere around here. But so what do you think then as a New York City resident and you're seeing the policies in government that are basically making this easier for terrorists to happen? What do you think about those policies? I don't do politics, really, but, I mean, somebody's going to get a handle on this. I, like I said, I don't want to put my two cents in on a political facet or say anything about that, but somebody needs to come up with a better idea because obviously nothing's working right now. All right, thank you for your time. Thank you. Hillary Clinton has just held a press conference where she blamed Donald Trump for the terrorist attacks and blames Donald Trump for ISIS recruiting and coming to America. Not the, not the wars we started over there that tore their countries apart. Not the radical religion of Islam. No, no, no. It's Donald Trump's fault. Not the liberal policies that, that bring these people here and basically 
just let them do whatever they want without any vetting. No, 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 no. It's Donald Trump's fault. Hillary, I don't think you realize something. When Donald Trump comes out and attacks ISIS and says we need to take ISIS out, of course ISIS is going to hate that. Of course they don't want a president of the United States that wants to stop radical Islamic terror. But you want to be tolerant of it, and then when it continues to happen over and over again, you will blame everybody else you can except your own policies, the wars you started in that region, and the lies that come out of your mouth. She blames Donald Trump, folks. Unbelievable. What will Hillary Clinton lie about next? You know, with all this talk lately about gun control, it occurred to me that I have yet to see a single politician who can explain to me how they plan to take guns away from the criminal thugs who are out there on the streets right now. Oh, sure, you'll hear plenty of talk about how they plan to take guns away from us, us law-abiding citizens. But if you take guns away from all of us legal gun owners, then the only people that will have guns will be the bad guys. In fact, I'm curious. I want to see a show of hands right now. All those for gun control, raise your hand. All right, there's one, two, three, four. Anyone else? Ah, see there, that figures. All the usual suspects. Any questions? Three terror attacks took place across the country this weekend. But the big story right out of the gate was how Donald Trump dared to jump to conclusions by referring to these explosions as bombs before all of the facts came in. Really, this is the issue that you have is that someone called it a bombing a little bit too early, even when what he said was exactly correct. Frankly, Margaret, I think that we can all begin jumping to conclusions now when there is an explosion that rocks the middle of a city near you. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely right. And what we do know about the bomber, Ahmed Khan Rahami, 28 years old, they shot him in the lag hand. They finally captured him. Six, six different instances where he was trying to blow up the city around him. He actually sues the police department because they discriminated <laughs> against him last year right. for being Muslim. But it turns out maybe they, you know, should have been looking at him because he tried to blow up New York City and he also tried to blow up northern New Jersey. So uh, perhaps Trump's conclusion, you know, he's being hammered right now. But honestly, Clinton ab adopts the same rhetoric that Trump has, but nothing is made of that. Right. And I think it's, you know, it's really great how we can point out how the American justice system is wonderful when you can use it to your advantage, like he and his family tried to sue the police department there. <laughs> But Margaret, what I found incredibly insulting about the way that the networks cover this, instead of live streaming this mayhem as it was mm -hmm. happening, they love to exploit these type of scenarios, total mm -hmm. paranoia. Uh, you know, let's be real. This is CNN, who for a month was talking about this missing plane, 24 seven news coverage. They didn't really cover it. They went immediately back to wall to wall birther coverage mm -hmm. and then covering the Emmys and this. So why such a whitewash of these attacks really downplaying what was going on? Well, Barack Obama, of course, plans to accept 110,000 more refugees in fiscal year 2017. Hillary Clinton is campaigning on the promise that she is going to increase that number by 550 percent. And like you mentioned, now following these attacks, Hillary Clinton gave a press conference this morning. And so she is adopting Trump's rhetoric. Mm -hmm. She's she's calling for tough vetting of immigrants. And she's adding we need a better visa system, you know, but until then, bring them in by the hundreds of thousands. We know that she's a pathological liar. It's no surprise that the Clinton News Network would be whitewashing the truth because they don't want you to understand it. They don't want you to understand what's going on, number one. Number two, how dare you question anything, you racist. If you if you dare question our immigration policies, be prepared to be totally slammed, both publicly and privately. But look, here's the deal. You were absolutely right. The, the 110,000 begins on October 1st. It's the first push. He's not going to even be in office when this takes place. The only hope that we have is that somebody steps up to the plate and says, you know what, maybe we should be questioning our immigration policies. We shouldn't be accepting people that uh, come from terrorist hotspots that are war torn, that have a vendetta against the U.S. Number one, you know, he's the only person in this race saying that. And she tries to steal and plagiarize his narrative. It's not working. She's tired. It's old thing. It's very, it's frankly very boring when she does it, Leanne, because it's clearly plagiarism. But going back to the immigration issues that the U.S. has, and we have a very cocked up system. You and I found this article on 
Yahoo dot, uh, Yahoo.com, uh, the U.S. government has mistakenly granted citizenship to at least 858 immigrants from countries of concern and national security with high rates of immigration fraud. So we're talking about nearly 900 people that had a deportation order in the U.S. and our own Homeland Security Department, um, <laughs> through an internal memo, they've decided that they've made it this gigantic cock up. They actually granted people that were on a deportation list um, instant fast track citizenship and three of these people I might have add have transportation credentials which means that they're currently flying planes that are commercial wow. aircraft that that people are, are on so Incredible. you know talk about a talk about a messed up system that we have DHS they're reflecting the fact that we have a long withstanding problem and unfortunately what we've seen is our president he even refuses to call radical Islam for whatever reason be it cowardness or be it an agenda that he has clearly as an agenda he refuses to call this what it is and and he tries to, the the media tries to unsuccessfully bash people who do Right. I.e. Trump, for right. example. And they do not want anyone to, to put that laser focus on the mm -hmm. fact that they are wanting an open door policy. One in five Syrian refugees settled in the New York area. Obama wants even more there. There's almost 100,000 Somalians admitted since 9-11. Almost 100 percent, 99.6 percent of those people are Muslim. So this is, um, you know, these mm -hmm. are not the westernized Muslims. These are the people who have a, a mm -hmm. culture completely We're incompatible to with hate the us. We were yes. taught to uh, rise up against us. It's, it's, there's an agenda happening. And I read, the, I, sometimes I read uh, blogs and forums and, and there's a clear agenda and it's it's a Western takeover of civilization. They understand the politics and practice of our hijacked liberal you know, political climate right now. And they understand that through the sympathy and, and apologist factor that there's this Trojan horse that's happening with, with refugees. You pointed that out. Well, 99% coming from a hostile region that want to do us harm, we're admitting them and all also, uh, they're beneficiaries of our of our welfare state as well. Well, I feel like both Hillary and Obama need to be charged with treason because mm -hmm. uh, Donald Trump pointed this out before. He said, you know, Obama, he he must know something or else he's just incredibly ignorant. He's got something else up his sleeve. Mm -hmm. Um, but there has, have been some major lies exposed here just recently. Uh, let's talk about the fact that Barack Obama campaigned on closing down Gitmo. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, once in office, found out that wasn't as easy as it sounds. Seven years later, now this facility remains open because the jihadists there are some most of them are the worst of the worst. Mm -hmm. But he still wants to keep that promise to shut down Guantanamo. He says it's a recruitment tool for organizations like ISIS. Uh, but here's the kicker. He said, Keep in mind, of the hundreds of people who have been released and the recidivism rate, there are going to be maybe a handful of them are going to be embittered and still engaging in anti-U.S. activities and trying to link up potentially with their oil organizations. But this is just false. It's not true. So when Obama made this claim, 653 detainees had been released. Of that group, 196 had been confirmed or sus suspected of returning to jihadist activity mm -hmm. Upon their release, of course, he released really high level uh, senior Taliban officials in order to secure the release of Bo Bergdahl. So totally dangerous. This is a time at uh, escalated threat levels from international terrorists. Mm -hmm. The president is releasing the most dangerous mm -hmm. leaders of the jihadist groups against the advice of the military and the intelligence community. Just saying, well, no, I, I made this promise. We got to shut it down. We have no plan for vetting them. We have no plan to keep track of them, mm -hmm. but we trust them. You know, and then, of course, he's like downplaying the threat <laughs> to the American him. people. Of course he is, because he understands the significance of the chaos that can be created when you have hardened jihadi criminals unleashed on the earth. It's almost, Leanne, if I didn't know better, it was almost like they were setting us up to, you know, the impending martial law, because we, we understand that the government is the savior. So when there's, there's a massive crisis, say a terrorist attack, they're the only ones that can save us. If I didn't right. know any better, he'd be setting us up for that. Uh, conveniently, if he ever does leave office, you know, there's speculation that something's going to happen between now and November 2nd. And we might be stuck with him. God help us if that is the case. Uh, but he definitely definitely looks like he's setting us up, he's setting us up for a future crisis. Well, absolutely. One of his big uh, accomplishments, of course, was the deal with Iran. And let's not forget that he lied to us, and now he's been caught in multiple lies over those mm -hmm. a cash payment <laughs> that he sent uh, to Iran on the same day uh, where they released the. Um, prisoners there, but it totally wasn't a ransom. That was that $400 million payment delivered in cash to the Iranian government. Well, now we actually know that the U.S. Um, 
According to testimony provided before Congress, the U.S. reportedly gave $33 billion to Iran in cash and gold between 2014 and 2016. But that's not all. You'll recall that Obama said that the reason why they had to give them all that cash is because we're so strict in maintaining mm -hmm. sanctions. We don't have a banking relationship with Iran. We couldn't just mm -hmm. send them a check or wire the money. That's not true because a Treasury Department spokesman confirmed on Saturday the U.S. made at least two separate payments to the Iranian government via wire transfer within the last 14 months. So just rolling out lie after lie. Mm -hmm. And indeed, probably we're going to find out the, the one of the other things he told us was that they don't know who the money was given to or how it's going to be spent. Mm -hmm. But I have a, a few ideas. Uh, of course. <laughs> so let's not forget but the, the aspect of the Iranian government that is considered to be a terrorist arm of that government. They have chanted death to America. They're building a nuclear arsenal against us. They're threatening Israel. They're pointing missiles toward the sky. You know, this is our president has given them money and aid uh, as a gesture of goodwill, as a gesture of reparations, if you will, because of some military uh, treaty gone awry, military act gone awry you know, some exchange that happened long before he was ever president of the United States. And, you know, his motivation, Leanne, questioning him as a president, as a leader, you know, I'm really encouraged by Trump's statement to call it like it is today. And it looks like he's making waves yet again. Unfortunately, though, we're seeing acts of terror committed on, on our own soil. And, and yet, what can we do except for highlight them and, and tell people the truth? It's totally unbelievable, but the American people are waking up to this lie, the lies and the deception. Well, thank you all so much for tuning into the show tonight. We will see you here again tomorrow, 7 p.m. Central.